And, and so as we get started, I just want to um, introduce Dr. Damaris and I will allow her to introduce herself and give you a little bit of her background. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I wanted to say this before the training started because it's something that I've probably not told her in depth before. Um, this is the person that actually has inspired my entire professional career and is one of the smartest clinicians that I have the wonderful opportunity to know and the person who told me to know when it's time to shut up when working with clients. So I'm going to turn it over to her as I know this is the time for me to shut up. Dr. Demerit, over to you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Aisha, uh, for that, for those kind words. Uh, you and I have been rolling in these mental health service, social service provider streets for a long time together. I mean, I appreciate you and I appreciate the United Way and the coalition for giving me this opportunity to come and share with the community, with the providers, with other licensed professionals um, about this very important topic. So thank you again. I am not going to bore you with all my background information. If we can just go ahead and mute your phones or your um, devices for me, thank you. I'm not going to bore you with all of my credentials and background. Uh, I am a, a social worker at heart. All the degrees that I have are in social work, the master's, the bachelor's, the license, the doctoral degree. Uh, I do love this field. Um, I love working with students in the field. I teach for FIU. I teach a social work and diversity course at FIU right now as an adjunct. Um, I do have a private practice where 95% of my caseload are predominantly women of color, Caribbean women of color. So I am going to be sharing with you tons of anecdotal information on today, just my experience in working with this particular uh, population. And we're going to talk about the research and the numbers and the stats and all that. But um, definitely, we're going to talk about what I'm seeing, right? What, what is really happening on the ground level? Uh, let's see here. Anything else that's pertinent? I think that's about, that's about it. So we're just going to go ahead and get started. Aisha, are we clear? We're ready to go. Can I share? Okay, she's probably muted there. All right, no problem. Okay, very good. So can I just get a thumbs up? Everybody sees my screen. We're all good. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so I always like to start all of my presentations and trainings and everything that I do with a quote. And I thought this one by uh, our uh, former president here, President Barack Obama, was timely and very uh, pertinent to the topic. To anyone out there who's hurting, it's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. It's a, it's a sign of strength, right? And so with this training, I want to accomplish a few things. We're going to talk about our objectives, but I want to accomplish a few things. And, and the first thing I want to do is provide education and give awareness, right, for people who are connected with people of color, um, with minorities, BIPOC, right, to understand what the struggles are and where the struggles come from. But I also want to talk to the many BIPOC that are on this training, right? Um, you might be a little triggered. You might hear something that kind of, oh, she's, 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 she's in my house. How, how does she know this is happening, right? Because our stories are a lot similar many times. So if you are triggered, the resources will be provided. Please reach out. Um, you know, I hope that you will feel seen during this presentation, that you will uh, know that there are people out here who understand the struggles and the things that you're dealing with, and that in the end, you will reach out for help and know that uh, there are different solutions that we could look at to help you in your particular situation. So what are our goals for this particular training? We're gonna understand suicide as it relates to minorities, marginalized groups. We're going to explore the prevalence and the risk factors. And then we're going to gain an understanding on how to support minorities who may be struggling with suicidal thoughts and or plans. So let's just dive right in, right? Let's talk about recent news. In the span of about two months, 
uh, we had back to back notable uh, deaths uh, by suicide in the community. Now, this is the stories that we see because these people are well known. Um, they are famous. They hold a lot of accolades. But there are plenty of other stories that we don't get to see in this way. So I just wanted to kind of highlight this. I'm going to play this. We may have to do some finagling to make sure you guys can see the video. Yep. OK, so give me a second. Let me stop the share Tonight, here. Several recent and okay. tragic headlines are sparking a renewed conversation about mental health. In the last two weeks. Okay. Put this over here. Can everybody see that screen with the, hold on. There we go. There have been three high profile suicides in the African-American community. The son of actress, Regina King, Ian Alexander Jr. was just 26. Actor Moses J. Mosley was 31. And former Miss USA Chesley Christ was only 30. Studies show overall suicide rates have fallen in recent years, but some indicate an uptick among minorities. 7 Action News reporter Kiara Hay goes in depth with a look at these trends and how the community is trying to get ahead of the problem. For the first time in history, suicides in the black community here in the U.S. is on the rise. And now mental health experts are trying to figure out why. They say death comes in threes. First, it was 26-year-old Ian Alexander Jr., son of Academy Award winning actress Regina King, committed suicide. One week later, former Miss America winner Chelsea Christ took her life at the age of 30. And on Monday, reports 31-year-old Walking Dead actor Moses Mosley died from a suspected suicide attempt. Dr. Brian Mahamdi, the director of behavioral health services at Henry Ford Health System, says the age range and race of these deaths are not a coincidence. More so than any other uh, demographic group, we've seen this just major increase among uh, young black uh, adolescents and young adults, which is, is very new and really hasn't ever happened in the history of, of the U.S. Their mental health is, you know, really challenged at this time. Patrice Lucas, a licensed mental health counselor, says black millennials and the Gen Z generation are in a unique situation because up until this point in history, black people have been in survival mode, but now many have the chance to thrive. And so you take that deep breath and you start feeling and it doesn't it doesn't sit well with them. I was just really, really sad sometimes. Clarisha Foster says despite having a 4.0 and a two parent financially stable household, she was struggling with her mental health in silence until she reached a breaking point. I'm not me. I am not myself right now. Foster says she saw one of her Facebook friends posting about going to therapy, so she decided to give it a try. A resource she admits she was hesitant about because of the stigma. But now she's an advocate of therapy and received her master's degree in it to help others. That's how we get ahead of it. Not just the individual counseling, it's the group counseling, it's the workshops, it's talking about mental health. Another reason experts say suicides are up among adolescents and young adults is because of social media. More people are aware of the issues not only happening in this country, but around the world, and there's a growing sense of helplessness. But there is help available, and we'll have some resources posted for you on our website at WXYZ.com. In Roseville, Kiara Hay, 7 Action News. Wow, such a very important issue, especially right now. Okay. Okay. All right, so there we go. So we are back to our uh, presentation here. So I did give Aisha uh, a couple of things. I did give her a copy of this PowerPoint so that she could share with you all. And I also gave her a uh, document that has the resources that we're gonna be going over here in our presentation for today. So you should have those um, 
in, or if, if they're not shared automatically, you can reach out and obtain a copy. Okay, so here we go with some of the stats, right? So according to the US Department of Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health, in 2019, suicide was the second leading cause of death for Blacks or African American ages 15 to 24. Okay, the death rate from suicide for Black or African American men was four times greater than for African American women in 2008. So what does that tell us? It tells us that men, men of color, are finding that dying by suicide or death by suicide is a solution more so than women of color. Black females, Grades 9 to 12 were 60% more likely to attempt suicide in 2019 as compared to non-Hispanic white females of the same age, right? And this is just a little bit uh, before uh, pandemic, COVID-19. So I am very curious to see what the data is going to look like after um, they have an opportunity to collect it. Um, take a look at this. Poverty level affects mental health status, right? We know that Maslow's hierarchy of needs informs us that, right? Like we need, uh, we have basic needs that need to be met and then we work our way to self-actualization. Okay, as compared to those twice over the poverty level, they are twice as likely to report serious, serious psychological distress. And then take a look at this. A report from the US Surgeon General found that from 1980 to 1995, the suicide rate among African American ages 10 to 14 increased 233% as compared to 120% of non Hispanic whites. Okay, the research is very clear and overwhelming. Something, right, in the 1980s, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Something triggered these. We had a live event with our hero 5K, which was incredibly successful. In the 1980s, what was happening, right? That was the beginning of our crack cocaine epidemic, right? And it really uh, causing havoc in Black and Brown communities. And then right after that, like right, right towards the end of the 80s, 90s, you had the AIDS epidemic. And then social justice issues were on the rise. 9-11 came shortly after that, the Great Recession. I mean, lack of opportunities, the increase in incarcerations for Black men. Uh, it's just like my uh, Bishop uh, Victor Tyrone Curry says. He says, when America gets a cold, right? Black America seems to get pneumonia, right? So the numbers are clear that we are at risk. The numbers are rising for us. It's, there used to be a gap uh, between uh, what we saw in terms of attempts for people of color and white people, but we are closing the gap. We are catching up and that is uh, very sad, right? Uh, I think we talk about it a little bit here. Mayor Kevin Ward, he is also a man of color, a, a mayor, and he recently took his life uh, by suicide. Suicide and non-fatal suicidal behavior in recent years have emerged as a critical health issue for Blacks, particularly among adolescents and young adults, right? According to the CDC, prevalence of attempted suicide for white and black high school students were 7.3 and 7.6 respectively. They were roughly equal. So again, that gap is closing. The greatest risk of progressing to suicide planning, and this is for my, my providers, right? My mental health counselors, look at this. The greatest risk of progressing to suicide planning or attempt among those with ideation happened within the first year of ideation onset. So once someone actually communicates it or talks about the ideation, that first year, that's a critical time to make sure intervention is happening. They're getting support that they need uh, because that's a very sensitive time. And then in 2006, an ethnicity by sex analysis revealed that suicide attempts was highest for Caribbean Black men followed by African American women, while Caribbean women had the lowest prevalence of attempts. So let's continue to look at um, the risk factors. So Joe et al. conducted research to examine the prevalence and correlations of suicide ideation, planning, and attempts across two ethnic classifications of Blacks in, in a nationally representative sample, right? And so this is what that research yielded. Blacks at a higher risk for suicide attempts were, here are the, here are the, uh, the risk factors, younger birth cohorts, 
they were less educated, Midwest residents, right, and had one or more mental health diagnosis. Okay, the attempters, so they spoke with these people who attempted and they asked them about their process and their thoughts about it. And this is what they found out, the nature of the intent of the suicide attempt. 41.7 endorsed this thought. I made a serious attempt to kill myself and it was only luck that I did not succeed, 41%. 13% endorsed, I tried to kill myself but knew the method was not foolproof. And then 44, 44 said my 44% said my attempt was a cry for help. I did not intend to die. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more. So Abraham Biggs is also a young man who took his life by suicide. I believe he was in college um, and he uh, resulted in death by suicide. Okay. I wanted to make sure that we were seeing some faces, maybe not nationally known for whatever reason, but we exist and we are dying by suicide. So let's look at a few more uh, uh, risk factors, okay? Lack of emotional support, right? Negative familial interactions. We're going to talk about all of these. Dismissive attachment, which is associated with less social exchange. Language barriers. Worrying about family back home and the need to provide for them. Separation from family and friends. Loss of a social network. Lack of information on the healthcare system and acculturation. So Caribbean families, right, they tend to place a high value on independence self-reliance and achievement. And this sometimes leads to a dismissive relational style, which yields less social support exchange, more distant social relations, and a decreased likelihood that children will seek out support in times of distress. So that's just, you know, here's, here's the real life example. I can really just kind of reach into my own world and give you my experience. I come from a Haitian family and we're very proud, um, very strong. We do the things that we need to do. We take care of our responsibilities, right? And so this relationship, right, that you have with your parents, it's more about you need to do the things you need to do to stand on your own two feet. You need to get it done. You need to take care of these things. You need to figure this out right? And so you grow up with this kind of relationship and you take it into adulthood. And when things get heavy, right, when things start to weigh on you, it is less likely that you would reach out to this family, to your family for support, right? Because what are they going to say? Oh, well, you need to get it together. You need to figure it out. What are you talking about? You need to work this out, right? There really isn't a whole lot of space for vulnerability, Right. Several of my Caribbean clients share this immense pressure to do well. Right. Many times choosing career paths that they did not want for themselves. Right. So the running joke among people in the Haitian community, young people, is you have four career choices. You're either going to be a nurse, a doctor, a lawyer or an engineer. That's that's what you got. That's the choice. Is anything outside of that? Your parents are confused. They don't know what that is. They don't know what that means, right? And, and so these individuals, they won't seek help or support from their parents, okay? In previous attempts, they would be told to woman up and their grievances would be dismissed. So needless to say, setting boundaries, building effective communication skills and assertiveness skills become key treatment goals, okay? Let's take a look at uh, worrying about family back home. So particularly with Caribbean families who immigrate here, there is a big attachment to family back home, right? Trying to figure out how to support and help family back home, as well as take care of what you need to take care of in this country, right? So there's this pressure to figure out, okay, well, we need to eat, we need to do the things we need to do, and we need to figure out a way to send money back home. Right. So there's there's that um, the pressure there. Loss of a social network. Right. COVID has done a job um, on all persons, all communities. Right. Disconnecting us, uh, taking away our, our normal ways of interacting. And so this is a huge, huge issue because we know maintaining your social circles and your 
circles uh, can be a, a deterrent for self-harm, okay? Uh, it, it was a heartbreak, you know, to, to use a young man who was so promising, uh, so intelligent. I mean, he was special. He was a, a one in a kind. Deerfield Beach High School head football coach Javon Glenn says his star wide receiver Bryce Gowdy wasn't just a great player, but also an outstanding student and a mentor to others. Hundreds turned out at this vigil to remember him and to pay respect to his mother and brothers. Glenn says Bryce sometimes shared his worries over leaving his family behind in perilous circumstances. Those are the things that tore away at his heart. Bryce was set to start college next week at Georgia Tech. And after I, and I told him, you know, we, we made it, baby. We, we're, we're almost there. Because I, I knew in the back of my mind if we can just get him to Saturday. We had already contacted Georgia Tech and kind of made them aware of some of the issues, made them aware of some of his struggles. But there was a one-week gap between final exams and going to Georgia. And with school closed for the holidays, Glenn says Bryce had no one to buoy him up as his worries increased. The, the thing that changed everything is he had a week, he had six days with no safety net. Monday night, Bryce left his mother and brothers behind in a motel room and walked into the path of a freight train. Friday, his saddened friends and teammates held candles to the sky and released balloons into the night. It really touched me that he died the way he died. Get help. Um, we always have counselors at the school. Um, we are here for them. If they need a call, call me. I'm here. Glenn says a plan to get Bryce's mother and brothers into a residential program for the homeless had just fallen through, and he doesn't think Bryce could deal with that uncertainty. And ultimately, uh, I feel like that that's kind of what broke him. The coach and the school are still working on trying to help Bryce's mother and brothers find a permanent place to live, and a GoFundMe account has already been set up. Terry Parker, WPBF 25 News. All right. So Brown et al. in their research concluded that when socioeconomic inequalities are perpetuated through generations, inequalities are further entrenched in depressive disorders over time. You know, I don't know how many of you remember this story, but this was a young, uh, a young athlete from Deerfield Beach, and he was getting ready to go um, to play uh, Division I football. And he just could not bear the thought of leaving his family in the conditions that they were in to go and stay on campus and live on campus and eat three square meals a day and have everything taken care of for him while his family um, was, was living in the conditions that they were in. It's a huge amount of pressure. And so this young man concluded that taking his life was the best option for him. Okay, so continuing with some prevalence and uh, risk factors, right? Factors with suicide, factors associated with suicide ideation and attempts for African American and Caribbean Blacks include decreased religious affiliation, okay, poor parental connectedness, we talked a little bit about that, cultural conflict or identific identification with Caribbean culture, higher exposure to discrimination income inequality, particularly in wealthy countries, right? So these are issues that really are unique to Black and uh, Brown and Caribbean families. We know that the church, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about the church, you know, later on in our uh, training here, but we know that the church has served as a, a, a staple in uh, Black, Brown, and Caribbean uh, communities to assist and provide resources and provide avenues and outlets uh, to youth and their families. So when they decrease that uh, participation or affiliation or uh, we get a pandemic and it no longer becomes a space that's available to go to, uh, then that uh, increases the likelihood that someone will think about uh, suicide or think about taking their lives when they find themselves um, in distress or in psychological um, distress and cannot find an avenue to uh, release those concerns. Imagine entering this country from a place, right, where everyone looks like you and having to have the learning curve about how to navigate race in America, right? So yes, you come to this country to fight for better opportunity, 
but you come from a place where everyone looks like you, everyone uh, operates like you. And then you come here and realize it's a different ball game. Things don't quite work the same, right? It's a huge learning curve and it can have uh, huge uh, ramifications. So what are some warning signs? What are some warning signs that someone might be uh, contemplating suicide or uh, creating, wanting to create a plan to take their lives? So the NIH offers these warning signs, right? And we're gonna talk about these warning signs and then we're gonna talk about anecdotally what I see in my practice. So you have individuals talking about wanting to die, great guilt or shame about something that happened or just in general about their lives or any you know anything like that being a burden to others feeling like you know maybe they have an illness and that requires lots of support or etc and then they feel like a burden feelings associated maybe emptiness hopelessness trapped or having no reason to live extremely sad right more anxious agitated or full of rage maybe some unbearable emotional or physical pain or making a plan researching ways to die uh, withdrawing from friends right we see that saying goodbye giving away important items or making a will taking dangerous risks now making a will is that's 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 good preparation, but when you start to make connections between making a will and all these other signs, then we, we really should be paying attention to um, what this person is probably trying to tell us. Taking dangerous risks, such as driving extremely fast, right? Uh, extreme mood swings, eating or sleeping more or less. Anytime you, get, anytime you get down to those basic needs, sleeping, eating, and they start to shift in one extreme or the other, that is something we need to pay attention to or using drugs and alcohol more often than you have the risk of overdosing or even an intentional overdose. Now let's talk about my anecdotal experience, right? So this just means it's not necessarily supported by research. However, this is what I see on a constant basis, right? I see people, I see particularly women, Caribbean women, women of color talking about, I just want, I just want things to stop. I just want it to stop, right? I got to do what I got to do. But when they say it, you can feel the burden. You can feel all of the pain that they're carrying. I just, I just got to do what I got to do, right? It's just too much, right? I hear that. Or unrealistic, unmanageable expectations of self, usually reflecting on, upon, or just after major birthday milestones. So it's so interesting that when I have the clients and I do an intake and I look at their birthday, oftentimes they either just had a birthday, their birthday is coming up very soon, or there's some huge milestone coming up, right? Your 21s and your 25s and I'm going to be 30 and oh no, here's 40, right, coming. So usually it's around that time where they start to think about themselves, their lives, what they've accomplished, what they haven't accomplished, right? And so you start to hear all of the concerns there. Then I see uh, them feeling overwhelmed, right? Tired, exhausted. You know, I, I'm just tired, Dr. D. Magda, I'm just, I'm just exhausted. I just can't seem to find the energy, right? Physical pain, some parts of their body hurting right? Accomplishments are short-lived. It's never enough or needing to do more, right? So I, I, I just did this big thing, right? But now I'm looking at the next thing and what I haven't done and what hasn't been done yet, right? It's never enough, right? Or I need to do more. I feel like I haven't done enough, right? And so some behavior that I've seen is staying in bed all day, calling out uncharacteristically. Someone who shows up to work, never really have an issue with time and attendance, and all of a sudden calling out sick, very uncharacteristically. Intense scheduling with no time for R&R, &R, this busyness, right? We're gonna talk a little bit about that. Avoidance, not showing up for sessions or, or meetings, right? Or showing up unkempt when I've, traditionally they show up and they're, they're uh, well-maintained, manicured, polished, but then they just kind of show up 
just unkempt um, or showing behaviors outside of the norm. I've seen clients, particularly those of Caribbean, Caribbean background, complain somatically right, as this is more acceptable and often learned behavior. It is important to always rule out medical issues, uh, but pay attention to this because it may be a cry for help. They may complain of feeling weak, tired, stomach, gastro issues, headaches, not being able to catch their breaths, right? Like we, we as the professionals, we know when we start to put all this together, we see panic attack, right? We know what these things mean, but for them, this is how they can explain it with, with you know, whatever knowledge that they do have or um, heart racing, right? Aches, pains, different part of the body feeling certain ways. Should and supposed to, right? These two words, should and supposed to often play a huge role, right? And this is what society, culture, maybe your, your um, upbringing um, say that you're supposed to have done or you have, you're supposed to have accomplished by now, plays a huge, huge role in how women feel about themselves, how men feel accomplished, in their current state. And so for me, I've seen Black women often articulate the struggle to have it all, right? Many share that their families um, stress educational and professional achievements. They want you to go to school. They want you to get your degrees. They want you to get a good job, right? And my mom always talked about good job. You have to get a good job, right? Um, but, but that leaves out when you're intense in that way uh, as a child working your academics it leaves little to no room for socializing or forming romantic relationships and then next thing you know you've done all the things you've gotten the degrees you've got the good job but then you say well i am alone now and i don't have partnership and so thus not being able to secure these partnerships due to high emphasis placed on educational endeavors leaves them feeling unaccomplished despite the accolades and achievements that they have because they should have had this by now or they're supposed to have that by now. We know persistent de depressive disorder, that's high functioning depression, right? And it's characterized by a depressed mood for most of the day than not for more days than not, for a period of more than two years, right? Following by one, two or more of the following, a poor appetite, over, um, overeating, insomnia or hypersomnia, low energy or fatigue, low self-esteem, poor concentration or difficulty making decisions, feeling hopeless, right? So we know that, and I've seen on my caseload that I am full with high functioning, depressed individuals right? They are doing everything. They have all the businesses. They are accomplishing all the things, but for whatever reason, they feel unaccomplished. They feel that it's not enough. They feel like they're not doing enough. I had a session um, the other evening and my client put it this way, Magda, it's just like, I feel like I'm running as fast as I can. And when I look around, I am in the same spot. I have not moved, right? People on social media often share their achievements, right? And accomplishment, right? They, we heard a little bit about in one of the videos, they talked about social media um, partially being um, uh, an, uh, a reason why people are feeling hopeless because um, more so they start to see all of the issues with race and all of the things that uh, cause us to feel when people of color in America that we're just not getting uh, a fair shot or fair opportunities or being treated justly. But I also see anecdotally, right, that my clients are watching uh, their peers or individuals on social media post all the things, right, all the accomplishments. They, they are living their best lives. But what they don't see, right, are their peers' uh, support systems, right, their resources, their privileges, their struggles, they don't see that. And so when they look at that, it creates an unrealistic expectation of self um, and those observing the accomplishments of others. I've heard colleagues and uh, good colleague friends of mine, they share that feeling um, like taking time to rest or recharge is unacceptable or unproductive. And being busy somehow equates to feeling productive. Right. And so what happens? 
uh, overcommit, overextend, overestimate um, the capacity to get it all done, leaving individuals feeling overwhelmed and basically just over it. Right. I remember growing up in my own household and I remember moments where I would be sitting down just watching TV, watching my shows, watching, you know, Family Matters and, and Steve Urkel and, and, and all that stuff. And my mom would very angrily come to me and say, what are you doing? And very confused. I'm like, what do you mean what I'm what I'm doing? I'm watching TV and you don't see anything. You don't see anything for you to do here. Wow, well, I am like you don't see anything for you to do around the house. And so this created a mindset in me that I have to always be on. Like I have to always be looking for something to do, something to create, something to whatever, what have you. Now, let me not act like this was all a bad thing because in the professional world, we call this initiative, right? We call this, uh, you know, being able to be a self-starter. Right. So in that sense, it was helpful. But personally, it causes anxiety to the point where when you, 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 you can't even give yourself permission to rest. Right. And, and, and it causes anxiety to not be doing something and guilt. When I do reparent myself, right, give myself permission to rest, I feel guilty. Right. We feel guilty. Right. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, Shesley Chris. So we're going to watch another clip on, on her. Okay. So the good thing about technology here is that we are going to find a way to watch this clip because I think it's very important. Um, that we see it here. So give me a second while I pull that up for you all. So while you're pulling that up, Magda, um, first of all, as a Caribbean black woman, um, yeah. we're hitting way too many points. I feel triggered. <laughs> I feel as if you were looking into my household growing up um, a, a little bit too closely. But one of the things that um, that I've dealt with with clients as well, not only the imposter syndrome of always feeling like you have to always be going, 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 but sometimes, especially in the Black community and the Caribbean community, um, those suicidal rates don't look, they don't always sound like I want to die. Sometimes it's not that direct. Sometimes it's not that they want to intentionally end their lives or intentionally die, but they'd be relieved if they weren't here anymore. <laughs> and you hear that too. You hear, I just want it to be over. I just want the pain to stop. I, I just, I just I, I've had clients who literally told me like, I just want to go to sleep and never wake up. Yeah. Um, you know, and so sometimes just because of the way we word things, it may not hit the markers on that suicide risk assessment that you're doing. But Correct. knowing how we use language is so important because the way that, especially, you know, African-American vernacular and Patwa and Creole, um, we talk in roundabout ways. Yes. But we know what it means. That's like a Caribbean person to another Caribbean person. I know what you be meaning, <laughs> but it doesn't always yes. sound like that. And that's so important to keep in mind that people don't always use proper English to say the words that are going to make you do go oh, wow, this is high risk, but it doesn't mean that they're not having the feeling. New details tonight about Chesley Chris's um, death. The former Miss- so critical that we are having this training so that we can know what it sounds like for different groups of people. Because yes, to your point, we're not hitting all these markers on the, on the uh, Columbia, but when you hear them say, I'm just tired and I'm exhausted, and I just want all of this to stop. As a professional, that's, that's key for you to say, what does wanting it to stop mean? Help me understand what that means. So I believe this is the clip. Um, if not, that's okay, because we, 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 we'll, we'll talk about um, the pieces that we need to talk about. So let's see here. You guys can still see the CBS 
the the okay let me play that USA jumped from a New York apartment on Sunday Christ's mother April Simpkins released a statement tonight saying Chesley lived quote both a public and private life in her private life she was dealing with high functioning depression which she hid from everyone including me until very shortly before her death the statement from Christ's mother sheds light on what Chesley was going through high functioning depression it's common in a lot of people, especially very successful individuals, according to a Piedmont Medical Center psychiatrist, and it can be hard to detect. But they're very good at masking it. They're also very good at deluding themselves. They feel that they can solve everything. This shouldn't happen to me. I can do anything. I got these degrees from this university. I've been promoted. I've been successful. I've ran these things. I've done these things. I can fix me. This shouldn't happen to me. Some warning signs of high functioning depression out of the ordinary mood swings that can last for weeks or even months. You might also notice the person suppressing emotions or masking their feelings. So let's let's talk about Chesley Chess, Chess, Chess Chris for a little bit, right? Here you have an individual who has uh, been a division one athlete. Okay. Division one athlete and has been a TV show host and is an attorney at law and has an MBA and is Miss Universe, right? Um, and somehow what she shares in different other videos and things that I've seen, what she shares is that she feels like she hasn't done enough and that she is running out of time. And working with biracial indigenous people of color, BIPOC, and working with black women in my space, in my office, I hear this more times than I can count. I feel like I'm not doing, an, I mean, running corporations have all practices, they educators, parents at home moms beautiful you know working at home moms and creating experiences i mean and they come to the conclusion somehow that they are running out of time and they have not done enough right so yeah very very um interesting and i would love to see more research on the matter and, and maybe it might be me i don't know but we definitely definitely need to take a closer look so let's talk about protective factors let's talk about prevention let's talk about interventions right so four major categories of uh, protective factors and prevention for um people of color who are dealing with suicidal thoughts ideations intense plans or attempts the church right so we know again the church has had a long-standing tradition of helping immigrants adapt to everyday life the church has also been traditionally a place to access resources and the belief of the church right that the religious ideas about suicide really serves as a deterrent for suicide so if if the individual that you know or that you're connected with or that you're working on or even if yourself if i'm talking to you and and this is all kind of in your house and you're kind of having feelings and emotions thinking about the things that i'm saying to you if the church has been something that you've been a part of or that you've been open to or that you know you've had experience then you know i would say try the church again um, try having your church family again see see how that helps because that additional community that additional support system really provides a buffer it provides a space for you to be able to share and talk and find people who can be with you when you're when you're struggling we know that family familial and social connections is key right families who can reach out they can make observation of loved ones and speak up or support a friend and family or a colleague in need right for many families of color this important prevention tool was stripped away why for the last two years we've been dealing with covid 
So when we used to have a barbecue for our Uncle Pete's birthday and everybody comes out and, you know, Auntie, uh, you know, Regina looked at your face and said, what's going on with you? You don't look right and was able to have a conversation with you in that moment and whatever you were feeling or whatever you were thinking, you were able to just kind of work that out. Those like casual opportunities for intervention among family and social situations was taken away right? So it's no wonder, it's no wonder that people are struggling. And then now our teens, our uh, preteens who were now developing these skills to be social, to be connected, social anxiety about returning back to the school. I mean, I was hearing agencies, people I was doing, uh, people, uh, students and people I were, I'm doing in supervision for, for their licensure, they would tell me, Magda, the social anxiety Referrals are through the roof. The children don't want to go back to school. They're scared. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to talk to people. Like it, it, COVID really did a number. And I don't think that we really see or know what the true fallout is going to be um, until uh, maybe, you know, as time goes on, we'll see that. And then I'm going to come back. I'm going to circle back to mental health um, interventions, but uh, group involvement. Right. And social media accounts, helping people get connected to groups, people that they can relate to. Um, I know uh, actually Aisha has a, a Facebook group and it's for moms. Right. And I thought it was genius giving moms a space where they can actually connect with each other and understand each other's struggle and not feel like they have to have it all together and that they have to get this parent parenting thing down perfect okay because there is no manual you got some guidebooks you got some ideas you got some theories you got some things but there is no real manual on how to do this thing you're figuring it out as you go so having groups being connected to different groups and people who can understand your challenges and and you can connect with is a huge huge protective factor now let's talk about my mental health uh folks and mental health interventions right so resolving traumas right we know that unresolved trauma ptsd uh, being triggered, these things can increase the likelihood for uh, suicidal ideations, intents and plans, addressing or resolving the source of the depression or anxiety. Sometimes it is an adjustment disorder or a situational depression or something that's coming up that you're super anxious about, a big exam or something like that. And we can help them problem solve and, and figure out how to navigate those challenges. Helping individuals hear me when I say, embrace their non-performative selves. Embrace their non-performative selves because oftentimes we have been told that we are only as good as what we produce. We are only as good as what we put out. And so we're constantly on, we're constantly doing the next thing. We're constantly trying to write the next big paper. We're constantly trying to figure out where the next certification and degree is coming from. And it's 24 seven and it's ongoing and over and over, right? It's okay. It's okay to help your clients to draw a line and say, I'm enough. I have done enough. I do that all the time. I come home and I said, you know, I've done enough for today. <laughs> That's it. I, I'm, I'm shutting down. It's done. I need to stop for the day. I need a nap. I need to let go of this project. Right? I need to take this off of my plate. I need help or I need a moment. All of these things are okay to say, to think, and to do. And no is a complete sentence. You do not owe everyone an explanation for every time you say no, that it is okay to use no as a complete sentence, okay? Risk assessment, developing coping and safety plans, right? So we know we have the Columbia that's very popular. Many organizations use the Columbia. The Columbia is a very popular because anyone from the, the community person, that's just in the community from the highest professional in the field or what have you can use that assessment to figure out what needs to be the next step for an individual who might be struggling, right? And obviously developing a safety plan, making sure that the person has a plan moving forward in the event that these thoughts become consuming and they, they, they're not finding a way out. Establishing and maintaining boundaries, right? 
Uh, it's important to look at solution focused interventions to resolve real life stressors such as employment, medical or housing challenges, right? Again, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If these basic, basic fundamental needs are not met, right? Why is it that we expect people to just be happy and meditate and appreciate, you know, the moment when we have real problems, we have real challenges, we need to figure this out. I'm about to be homeless and T minus two weeks and I don't have anywhere to go. Rent for inefficiency is $2,000 and I don't know what I'm going to do, right? Family counseling, absolutely. Finding healthier ways to engage and connect with the family of origin. With my Caribbean families, with my Caribbean clients, this is huge, helping them to reframe and rethink what they expect from their parents um, and helping them figure out new ways to reconnect um, because, you know, you have your parents who come from another country, they come here in this country and they're on survival mode. They don't have a lot of time for feelings. They don't have a lot of time to be sad. They just need to feed and pay bills and get it done. And so you, the next generation, you get to grow up in this country where we talk about feelings and we talk about relationships and we talk about spending time. And then you start to feel away because, well, I didn't have that type of relationship with my mom or, you know, I can't talk to my mom in that way. And it starts to create this void. Right. And so I have to talk to my Caribbean clients a lot about understanding where their parents are coming from and managing those expectations and then finding new ways to reconnect and rebuild the kind of relationships, redefine the relationships. Right. And then rebuild them in, in, in another way accepting limitations right and promoting seasonal language this is something that i like to say uniquely promoting seasonal language and i'll explain to to you what that is in a moment so accepting limitations understanding that you know this is not something that i can do right now and not feeling guilty about it promoting seasonal language is simply helping people to realize that you can work to have all the things that you want, but maybe just not all at the same time, right? This might be the season where you're working on your master's degree, you might be dating, and then you get married, and then you build a family, and this might be the season to focus on the family. Not the season to focus on the family and try to build a business and try to do this and try to do that and try to do all the things, right? So promoting seasonal language, understanding that, okay, for this period of time, this is where the priority is, this is where you wanna focus, okay, and then in your next season, when different things shift, when the children start school, it'll free up some time, and then maybe you can start working on this, that, and the third. So promoting seasonal language can be super, super helpful. I found it to be helpful with my clients, right? This idea that people are running out of time it's about setting goals that they need to accomplish by some magical age, right? Leaving no room to really appreciate the progress, what I've actually done, but constantly looking for what's next, right? Um, pharmacological intervention, right? We wanna be careful here. We already know that there is um, some hesitancy with accessing mental health services. Although I must say, if my caseload is any indication of where we're going, I am super excited because we are asking for help. I have a waiting list. I am referring people out because I can't handle the load. So I am very excited about where we're going. Um, but however, medication is still very mm, taboo, right? So we need to be mindful of how we bring up this recommendation and how we assist clients in really evaluating if that's a, the right option for them, right? Island people, Caribbean people tend to be very proud and private. Demonstrating vulnerability does not come easy, okay? Saying I am not well or I need help, that is major. That is huge. And so when you can normalize vulnerability and give your clients a safe space to be, right, it's, it's, it's so, 
it's so good. <laughs> it's the only word that I can think of. It's so good. And then we have our traditional evidence-based therapeutic approaches. Acceptance and commitment therapy is one of the ones I love. Um, really looking, it's an action-oriented approach. And it's really, it really helps clients to stop avoiding, denying, or struggling with feelings, really just kind of accepting the feelings, thinking of feelings like a cloud that's here, but eventually it's going to go away. So you acknowledge it, you allow yourself to feel, and then allow the cloud to move on, right? Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, it's tried and true. Uh, I love CBT, right? We look at our perceptions, we look at our cognitive distortions, we look at our thinking errors, and we, we work on changing our perceptions. And then that trickles down to how we feel, which trickles down to what we do, which trickles down to our outcomes. And yes, mindfulness, meditation, prayer, if it's appropriate for you, um, really living in the moment and, 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 and taking time to smell the roses, right? Uh, super, super helpful as well. And then you have a dialectical DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, also an intervention that is really, really helpful with for people who have um, severe and persistent mental illness, uh, personality disorders, and it can be, there's evidence that it can really, really help with mood disorders, suicidal ideation, self-harm behaviors, and even substance use disorders. So I wanted to take some time to look at some resources and some tools uh, that are available. Uh, we can go on and on about all the resources in our greater Tri-County area, right? So, but for our purposes, being that we have the majority of participants here seem to be Broward and Miami-Dade County, 211 is the gatekeeper, right? You go into 211 and you can find your way to wherever it is that you need to go. Obviously, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline if you didn't know, now you know. I would actually love it if you guys take a moment to record this phone number in your cell. Have this number in your cell, not only for you, but you never know who you may need to text that contact to or share it with someone or send it to someone. And having it right there in your phone book uh, can be a super time saver. So definitely, definitely save that. Also, Help is a, now a text click and a call away. You can also text hello to the crisis text line to 741741 and you'll get someone there to chat with you, you know, on your number. You're not alone. You're never alone. I'm so grateful for these 24 hour, seven days a week services where, you know, when when there are no other people that you're connected to that you can reach out to, some you can always make a call. You can always text. Now, here are some resources that I've found that some of my clients have found me or they've come to the table with. Uh, Open Path Collective. Um, this is a, a nonprofit organization and what they do, they've created a, a, a opportunity for people who are underinsured or uninsured to access private um, pay services at a discounted rate, right? Mm -hmm. So you have your community mental health centers, you have other resources in the community that you can get help through for sure. Open Path Collective is just another avenue that if you want to work with like a private practice practitioner, but you don't have enough insurance or you don't have any insurance at all, you can get a rate. Like there's a, a, a window of a rate that, that the provider cannot go above. I think $60 is, is that. And so you, uh, the, the person will form a, will join Open Path Collective, right? Like there's a membership and then they pay the rate that the therapist tells them. So anywhere from 20 bucks, 25 bucks an hour, 30 bucks, but no more than 60. Okay, uh, these two foundations, I have had clients to come to me with these vouchers, uh, the Loveland Foundation that provides about, I believe it's four sessions at no cost. They, and you would just take that, those voucher numbers to a provider who accepts the Loveland Foundation vouchers and you can get those sessions at no cost to you. The Boris L. Henson Foundation, that is Tarji P. Henson, um, her foundation uh, in, in honor of her brother, I believe it was. And they also offer vouchers at no cost and you can use those vouchers. And then there are the websites uh, that I have come to really, really appreciate that helps um, BIPOC find 
uh, the resources that that they feel comfortable with. And I'll tell you, the research shows that having a clinician that looks like me might draw the person into treatment, but tried and true, the therapeutic relationship is what sustains it. So yes, it is important that we have representation and people can find therapists that look like them, but it is not enough to just look like them. We need to provide good quality treatment. Okay, so therapy for black girls, many of my clients find me through this particular platform and then there's therapy for black men as well that provides a good database of, of men who uh, provide well they have. Uh, clinicians who identify as women female as well, but you can also find a good a bank of men therapists. And then there are the trainings that exist. I am so thankful in Miami-Dade, I believe in Broward too, many of our police officers are getting the CIT training, crisis intervention training. So therefore, if someone is having a crisis and they need support and they need help, you can call the non-emergency line and you can specifically request a CIT trained officer so that when that officer arrives, they know that they're entering a situation or a circumstance that is not requiring them necessarily to come out in full force or aggressively, right? So the mental health first aid training, also very popular. Um, I know in Dade, NAMI in Miami and NAMI in Broward, I believe they offer that particular training. That is for anyone and everyone who wants to know and understand what to look for, what to pay attention to as it pertains to uh, someone who might be having a mental health crisis. The Columbia suicide screening and training. So if you have, if you're working with professionals, you can go to this website and you can access uh, online trainings or you can request that someone comes to your organization and provide the training to understand how to use the Columbia tool. And then the Brown Stanley safety plan. If you are working with clinicians, if you are a clinician, if you are in private practice, it doesn't matter where you are in the school system. If you're working with clients and you do crisis assessments, you should also have a safety plan tool that you use to help your client create a plan. We should never allow a client to leave our presence knowing that they are in crisis without a plan if they did not meet criteria for hospitalization. So the Brown Stanley Safety Plan is the most popular. It is um, supported by CARF, I believe. I'm not quite sure about Joint Commission, but in the end, this is what basically should be and needs to be included in a plan that assists someone to have something ready in the event that they find themselves in a mental health crisis. Okay. So that is our presentation for today. I want to thank you for taking the time to be here with us to learn about uh, BIPOC in the community, listening to my anecdotal experiences. And at this time, to the best of my ability, we're gonna open the floor to any questions. Aisha, can you assist me in facilitating that? Yes, I will start off with my first question is, why are you dragging us, sis? <laughs> like, I was here, I have been just very, very grateful for so much of the information that you shared today, because it is relatable <laughs> in so many ways, not only from a personal experience, but a professional experience from an observational experience, from a friend experience. I have several strong friends right now that I'm gonna text because I've heard so many of the exact things that you talked about come from their mouth or be posted on their social media. So thank you, first of all. Thank you for your expertise and the work that you do in that community. And I know um, there was one thing that you said that really stood out to me about we're showing up. We're going to therapy a lot more than we used to. Um, yes. <laughs> and I'm grateful. I, I follow the therapy for Black girls. I follow therapy for um, Black men. I, I follow the healing for Black men. Um, and, you know, we are, it's, a, it's becoming a lot more prevalent for us to tap into getting the help 
and the healing, but it is so important for us to have clinicians who understand us, who speak like us, who look like us. Um, I am grateful I was able to find my personal therapist who is a black Jamaican woman who yells at me in Patwa during sessions. And it just hits a little bit differently when you hear your language being spoken back to you. You're like, uh oh, she's serious. <laughs> um, so heavy on the AAV, heavy. Um, because we need to know that where our cultures are being understood. And for those of you who aren't from the same, you know, racial or ethnic background, it is so important to understand um, the dynamics of those experiences a little bit more um, and to understand the vernacular. I stay on TikTok so I can understand the Gen Zers when they speak. <laughs> so learning the so language. Let important. me ju let me jump in here, Aisha, because Anna Henry, uh, she posted something and she said the stigma of the African-American community being lazy, right? So then there's this pressure that we need to do more and we have to be twice as good and we, and we have, have to, to overachieve to extra and we have to overachieve because we don't want to be perceived as lazy. And many of us were raised in homes where we had to do the exact same thing. Lest our parents say to us, why are you being lazy? Like, why are you not doing enough, right? So really helping people to just kind of scale back. Um, uh, there's a there's a couple of books that a friend of mine recommended. One of it, one of them was called An Unhurried Life. And the other one was uh, Women Lie, Lies Women Believe that I'm very, very excited about digging into because my goodness, the pressure to perform and the pressure to be seen and this pressure that we have to be twice as good to get just as far, it is real. It is very real. And we have to deal with that. And we have to talk about that. I see, um, first of all, there are people, the, the chat box is filled with thanks and appreciation for you. Um, Jessica Jefferson, definitely talking about all the languages um, amongst the diaspora. Um, Lauren says she knew you when you were there in Pensacola and interning oh. at Pathways for Change. Oh and my God! <laughs> back, back in the day, pre-Dr. Demerit. Pre-license, <laughs> pre-all of it. <laughs> and what an informative, helpful, and timely presentation. Um, and I definitely agree. I was very surprised on Monday when I was looking up the theme and I saw that it was Black Health and Wellness. And I wish that the theme of every Black History Month was just announced a lot bigger. You didn't have to go searching for it because especially over the past two months with the back-to-back -back deaths, I was very impacted. It, I don't know them. <laughs> I don't know these celebrities, but I definitely was in group chats going, why are we dying? <laughs> um, it, we, I feel like we're endangered if we're not being killed. Somehow we're killing ourselves. It's, 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 it's fearful to live in black skin in this country. Um, so I'm so grateful. Um, I got a lot of questions, so let me clarify. This training was recorded today. Um, it will be made available in a few days. It will be uploaded on our YouTube page for United Way of Broward County. You can, um, and Magda, if you can drop the names of the book in the chat box so people know those books you were talking well, about. Some of them, I believe, are <laughs> faith based. So just heads up um, it's The Unhurried Life. And um, oh, I am. Okay, everyone, there we go. The, the Unhurried Life and Lies Women Believe. So if you want to, um, once it's uploaded, you can email me and I'll share the link with you. Or if you want to just search our YouTube um, page and find it, you can definitely share it. However, Dr. D will be doing this presentation again in, um, in June. She will be presenting the week of Juneteenth because if y'all don't know me, for those of you who aren't familiar with me, I'm very strategic in how I organize my brain. And so this presentation will be made available on June 15th. Um, and anybody is welcome again to sign up. If you need certificates or CEUs, and Sophia, I see you have your hand raised. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and then I'm gonna um, get to you. If you need CEUs or 
um, certificates, please go ahead. I already saw, even though I said, um, please wait until the end of the training. I saw the overachievers <laughs> already emailing me. Um, so I've seen your emails. Please send me your license number if you need CEU so I can enter it into CE Broker. If you need a certificate of attendance, please let me know. I will get that to you. Um, all of those will be done at least by the end of the week. If you can all go ahead right now and complete this survey, I will give you the easy way to complete the survey. Um, hold on one second. Actually, let me copy and paste it so I can put it in the link. So you yeah, guys can be either click on the link or you can use your phones pointed at the screen. The QR code will um, populate the link directly for you and you can enter the survey there. And then I know Sophia, you have your hand raised if you wanna go ahead. Well, I hope I'm clear. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. This is Sophia, I'm from New York City. And yeah, one thing that's needed is what is here. And um, you know, it's just been quite overwhelming. There's mental illness in my family. I too struggle with depression and diet, PTSD. I do have a hoarding disorder, which people know little about. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to get help for folks here in New York City to get um, support groups. And uh, just as of last week, my brother has been uh, institutionalized for the sixth time with bipolar disorder. And I just think about how um, the pressure, you know, us growing up in that family, um, both my parents are still here, but they weren't kind of parenting. It was that whole thing coming to the U.S. and trying to, they have time, you know, it really wasn't that intimacy of hugging and I love you and all that stuff. Correct. And, yeah. And so we, we don't think that it's, it matters, but I just recently read a book and I tell you, uh, I think about the young lady who took a life and... Oh, I don't think you're, I'm trying to paste it in here, but the name of the book was The Deepest Well, and it talked about the ACE test, and it talked about, that. I think there's 10 criteria, and if the more numbers you have, the more jacked up you tend to be. I was like, my God, and then a lot of therapists don't know about the ACE test, and I'm trying to, <laughs> gosh, I was trying to put it in the, in, the, in the chat, but that was such a rude awakening for me in regards mm -hmm. to, I was like, what? This, this young lady went through, because yes, she's overachieved, she's done a lot of stuff, but what has happened in her childhood perhaps she didn't talk about? You know, some of the traumas that us, as especially in communities of color, we don't want to talk about, we don't want to talk about the, the touching uncle did, the touching that the siblings did, all that, the sexual mm -hmm. trauma, you, you know, the it, 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 there's a lot going on. So we have to deal with our life that we're dealing with presently, and some stuff we perhaps we haven't addressed yet. And I, I am thankful people are more people are going to therapy. I'm the type of person that's like, I'm off to see the wizard. I post it on my Facebook page. I don't care. <laughs> I'm off to see the wizard. I'm in, in my 50s, and I seem like I've been going to therapy on and off for the last couple of years. And my main issue, honestly, was my West Indian mother, who is who needs help herself, but is, refuses to get the mental uh, health uh, you know, intervention that she needs, and that has wrecked havoc in the whole family. Um, so I'm glad that this, this program is here. I'm glad that you made it. I'm glad that I found it. I happened to find it on um, Facebook or Eventbrite or wherever I found it. I'm late for my another meeting, but I'm so glad I made it, and I'm glad I stayed here. And Sis Asia, I will, I'll be reaching out to you. Thank you for scheduling this. No but uh, yeah, we need to spread the word and and take away the stigma and the shame about addressing. You need if you can't see, you wear your glasses. If you need your medication, take your friggin' meds because this is no joke. It's no joke. It's only going to get worse. And we have to erase the sting about the stigma about it. We have to erase the 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 um oh, the shame about it. That's why I talk about my hoarding disorder. You know, I I just have to talk about it. And I think as we talk, especially as women. We can heal, and we only could heal in community. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm thankful for the both of you for having us today. So just the yeah. fact that you you opened up about that, right? Um, you know, as a clinician, I, I wouldn't, you know, it would be unethical for me if I push my clients to go and talk about all of their issues, right? But when you do get into a space where you are comfortable with who you are and comfortable with your challenges enough to be able to open up and share, 
oh my goodness, right? The, the, the connection that that makes and the, the permission it gives for other women who look like you to be able to say me too, right? It is huge. So thank you for um, being vulnerable in this particular space. And I know that it will have great implications for others who are hearing it. You'd be surprised what you put on your Facebook and how many inbox messages I have. Who can you refer somebody? Here, here's the list of names. Here's the zip code here, you know, um, so I'm glad people are at least reaching out. They not they won't yeah. put it on my post, but they'll inbox me, and and I'll give that information. So yeah. it's just about being open. Thanks so much, ladies. Thank, thank you. you, thank you so much for sharing, Sue, and thank you for sharing in the chat. Um, as Samuel, um, I see Jennifer. You have your hand raised. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Magma Magda, and uh, Isha for uh, your presentation. That was fantastic and extremely timely. Um, I am from Canada and my ancestors are uh, African-American. And um, yeah, so the whole legacy of slavery and race and sexual violence, all of that is rampant in my family and has just been a, an intergenerational cycle that's on a repeat loop. And I have been working really, really hard to break that cycle in my life. And I had a conversation on the weekend with a friend who told me, he, he knows that I'm a survivor of sexual violence and he's also a survivor of sexual violence. And he has been dealing with uh, just repeated victimization, not getting help, not getting justice, not getting support, not being safe over and over and over and over. And he told me on the weekend that he's been working with an organization to plan his assisted suicide. And he's 39 years old. Ooh. Yeah, and I'm not a counselor, I'm not a therapist, I'm not, I don't work in suicide prevention. And I was like, whoa. Uh, and I've had several friends that have committed suicide who are all survivors of sexual violence. Yeah. And I'm just wondering um, if you have any suggestions on how to support someone that's in that situation. So one of the things, um, before I answer that question, one of the things I want to make sure is that we absolutely get um, how we talk about this right. So we can say die by suicide, we can say death by suicide, but we no longer use committed suicide, right? Because that indicates or translate to a crime, right? Like they, they, they committed a crime of some sort. And for many people, it's not that they committed a crime, it's that they, this is the only way they see out. But that comes from a lot of the religious uh, pieces and, and that in the third. So um, now correct me if I'm wrong. And he, so the person you're speaking of, they are from Canada and in Canada, is that allowed an assisted suicide? Is that legal? So he's actually a friend. He lives in Ireland. Okay. So in Ireland, it's something that's legal. He would be going to Switzerland. He would go, oh, he would go to Switzerland to get it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's hard to contend when there are laws that make it where these things are possible and people can make these choices, right? So we can have a debate. I can have a debate all day long um, with people who agree with the ability for someone to do something like this. You know, people might say, well, they're going to do it anyway. They're going to find a way to do it anyway. Well, they might as well do it safely or find a, you know, way to, you know, do it where it's least, you know, least aggressive or, you know, whatever, what have you. So we can have a conversation and debate about that. But, you know, I, I, I believe that the best thing you can do is just be there, communicate, talk, you know, for many people, um, there are some, um, some data that shows once someone decides that there is no going back, that they, they will complete that process. So there is no changing their mind. So they're, they're, So it's very, very hard. So I would just say to you, be there as much as you can, be there to communicate, reach out, you know, talk about life, talk about how things could be, you know, talk, use seasonal language even, right? It might be difficult now, it might feel this way now, but things do and always change. And so I would say to do that, that would be my 
my best thing to say to you because when there's laws that allow for things to happen, it's very difficult to intervene like we would in this country, right? Which would be hospitalization or um, giving, putting them on hold and, and providing them with the care and support they need to keep themselves safe. I will say too, um, and I think everything Dr. Demerit said was absolutely correct. Um, I, I worked in two psychiatric hospitals here in Broward County, and it has been my experience that when people are in the moment, and I'll say in the moment because people who aren't always suicidal, it's, um, it, it, may be, it may seem like that, but they're not always. But in the moment, one of the most impactful things in so many people's life is having supportive um, network of friends, of family, of people around them to support them. And I, that has been a huge protective factor and deterrent. Absolutely. It, is, it has been a lot harder in a socially distanced and physically distant world. So sometimes you, you can't just go over to people's house like we used to, we can't travel like we used to. Um, but offering positive non-toxic social supports is often a deterrent in a lot of people's lives and keeping them from actually attempting. And at the end of the day, and I say this as someone whose personal life has been impacted by the death of suicide in my family, there's only so much you can do, but we can all just do the best that we can. Um, right. And so that feeds into part of the training, right? We have to accept our limitations. We have to know when, when and what we can do and accepting that, unfortunately, that has to be enough because you cannot dictate and, and make someone do any one or, you know, thing. So accepting your limitation and understanding and accepting that you've done enough, that you've tried, that you've put your best foot forward to support someone but in the end, they will make a choice. They will. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you for sharing that. That is a very unique experience. And I'm glad that you were at least here to get this information. Um, I am going to, and I know that if you have to leave at any time, please <laughs> go ahead and do so. But I do have um, two hands raised that I just want to make sure we get to. Um, Absolutely. I know. And I say that so the attendees, not to you, Dr. Marco, because I need you to say it so you can answer these people um, just a little bit, just a few more minutes. Um, and so, yes, you came off mute. So go ahead. You were my first hand up. Felicia. Hi, I'm a Barry University student, MSW. Um, I don't see a lot of students on here or hear them talking. Um, I'm also from Canada. So the, the young lady that spoke before, mm. I have a lot in common with her. I live in... Um, Florida, Fort Lauderdale at the moment. And I'm just wondering if there's any opportunities for internship or placement opportunities for students like myself that want to work with this population. Yes, what university are you attending at the time? Barry University. Barry University. So send me an email, we'll talk. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. I will also say just to my shameless plug we um, have a Broward County Suicide Prevention Coalition um, that has been working on all the suicide prevention efforts here. We have meetings and work groups. And so if you send me an email, I will um, connect you with our suicide prevention and wellness coordinator. So anyone who is interested in the um, data work, in the prevention efforts, in the trainings that we offer through the coalition can always um, participate. And this is a community collaborative um, that really came out of the death of Christ in Deerfield Beach um, and addressing a lot of the cluster of attempts and deaths that we saw around that time. So. Yeah. Thank you both very much. You're welcome. Absolutely. Thank you. And Elizabeth, you are the next hand that I have up. Thank you. And thank you for this wonderful training. It's been so informative. And I just wanted to comment that um, as a trauma therapist and EMDR mm -hmm. certified therapist, that uh, my experience is that often is a precursor, you know, that unresolved trauma is often a precursor to suicide and that, that trauma is absolutely treatable and that, you know, that, that can be something that um, 
you know, can totally shift a person's perspective on life and, uh, you know, their, of course, mood and affect. And so um, I think that's something that we have to always remember to, you know, to check in on what traumas they've experienced and, and uh, you know, approach resolving that. Yeah, that's just for, my comment. But thank you. It's been a great training. No, absolutely, Elizabeth, for our mental health professionals, right? Assessment is so critical, right? Collecting all those pieces and looking at the different systems and looking at the history and collecting the trauma, because you're absolutely right, right? That is one of the primary things that we need to do is help them with their unresolved traumas, <laughs> so that they can see and recognize a different life without the trauma being their story ultimately right that they can create a new story um, by working through the old one so absolutely i also do want to say for um all our clinical practitioners um direct service um staff anyone who is working directly with marginalized populations um and i i i can say this because the American Psychological Association has come out with self-awareness and acknowledged that a lot of the psychological and clinical practices in the United States um, have historically been Eurocentric and whitewashed and is not applicable to a lot of ethnic and racial minority groups. Um, and they acknowledged that last year, I believe. Um, there was an intense letter about how they're addressing things and um, there is currently about to be launched a new um, DSM-5 revised version that will address systemic racial discrimination and barriers that individuals have been impacted by that mm -hmm. also influence the development of mental illness in yeah. Black and Hispanic and Indigenous communities. Yes. <laughs> Ethno-racial trauma is a thing. Ethno-racial trauma. I got a whole trauma. training on ethnic and racial trauma. Yeah, um, ethno-racial trauma is a thing, but it is not included in the DSM. And those who experience ethno-racial trauma are relegated to uh, PTSD diagnosis. So. Yes. And sometimes they're not even given PTSD diagnosis. They're called oppositional defiance. Oh, yes, oppositional defiance. Yes, aggression. Yeah, personal. Yeah, all, all the other things, I, I, except I what it is. I, if I, I think Magda may have been in the meeting with me where a supervisor <laughs> told me I was that <laughs> once. And I was like, oh, okay, because I was very angry black woman in that moment. Well, we worked with the youth, right, uh, together, Aisha, and we saw it, that they were ADHD, our children who are in foster care, they were ADHD, they're oppositional defiant, they were conduct disorder, no, they were traumatized. They were traumatized. Yeah. So and I want everything but that diagnosis. Yes. I want you all to be mindful of the fact that if the APA can acknowledge the history of how therapy has been whitewashed and Eurocentric, um, that traditional forms of therapy that we learn in a lot of the universities um, that we are taught by the books that have been developed may not work for ethnic and racial minorities. And so please explore, especially when talking about trauma, please explore alternative and creative um, methods of addressing the needs of these communities because sometimes trying to get, and I'll use this population in particular, trying to get black men to sit before you and talk about their emotions yes. and, and therapeutically go, how do you feel about that? Is not gonna work. <laughs> so please be mindful of what will work for certain cultures and explore alternatives use creative alternatives um, to addressing their needs and what will work for them. So thank you all. I see that um, people have completed my survey. I am so grateful. I am grateful for your feedback and discussion and your stories that you shared. Um, I am most grateful so much for Dr. Um, Demerit who gave us such insight and statistical data on what is happening. And happy Black History Month, everybody. Um, Black history is American history, and I hope that um, you take the 28 days we've been given um, to celebrate yourself for the month and carry that throughout the year. Um, I'm going to log out now, if that's all we've got for today. Um, and for everybody who's here, I just want you to know I'm not just Black for this month, I'm Blackity Black all year long. So. <laughs> <laughs> Grateful to have you.
Bye, everybody. Thank you all for your attention. Be well.